So, hi everyone. My name is Francesco Pinto, and I'm one of the authors of Pillar, how to make semi-private learning more effective. In particular, I think you've seen this definition already enough this afternoon, so I will be very brief. What is differential privacy? Suppose we have two different data sets. These two different data sets differ only for one sample. Then what we want to do is to apply an epsilon delta differentially private algorithm, and uh, the differential privacy guarantees basically tell us that the models that come out of the learning algorithm in this case are gonna be indistinguishable. Now, what is the problem with differential privacy? One of the problems with differential privacy is basically that the performance can drop horribly. In particular, suppose that we have a pre-trained ResNet 50 and we extract the features of a data set, for instance, like Cephar 100. If we train a linear classifier on top of these features with an epsilon guarantee of 0.1, what we obtain is an accuracy that can be lower than 15%. What's the problem? The problem is that the corresponding non-private accuracy is actually greater than 80%. This is an extreme drop in performance. And uh, this is not just something that is observed empirically on one data set, but actually there is some theory about this. And uh, there are lower bounds that guarantee that the excess empirical loss is always going to be greater than a quantity that is proportional to the dimensionality of the problem. And uh, the, uh, the question we are trying to answer in this paper is, can we do better? Can we remove the dependency on the dimensionality of the problem and get higher utility from differential private training? How do we do this? Well, firstly, let's introduce the setting of semi-private learning. The assumption is that we have access to some public and labeled data. And this data, for instance, can be available because you scrape it from the web or because, for instance, uh, the right to protect this data is no more in enforced. Uh, then we assume to have access to some private label data and uh, the privacy on this data set should be protected with the traditional epsilon delta guarantees. Now, we propose an extremely simple algorithm that just for instance, uses the public data in order to estimate the top K principal components. Then what it does is it projects the private data on top of the K principal components, top K uh, principal components uh, we have estimated at the previous step. And then we run whatever learning DP algorithm we care about, in this case, noise GD, uh, and we do it on the projected private data. What, uh, what we get as an output is a linear classifier that satisfies the epsilon delta guarantees. Now, uh, the algorithm, which is very basic, allows us to uh, obtain some theoretical guarantees. And in particular, we need to make a couple of assumptions in order to derive these guarantees. The first assumption is that the data has large margin. We denote um, a lower bound on the margin as gamma. And the data also has low rank separability. Uh, and we denote this with a symbol C. In particular, the main theoretical result of the paper is that the algorithm of Pillar of obviously outputs an epsilon delta DP estimator. However, for every choice of alpha and beta greater than zero, the error of this classifier is gonna be lower or equal than alpha with a probability greater or equal than one minus beta. And this occurs at a very specific sample complexity. In particular, we have assumed to have access to both public and private data. In terms of private data, we are assuming that the amount of available private label data is greater or equal than this quantity. As you can see, this quantity no more depends on the original dimensionality of the problem, but depends on a parameter k, which is exactly the, um, the, the, the dimensionality of the PCA we chose. And uh, as you can see, as the margin increases, the amount of private label data you need to uh, obtain this estimator is lower. Similarly, for the public and label data, what we can observe is that the lower rank is the uh, classifier we're going to talk about, um, the, the less public data you need. 
In particular, let's delve a bit deeper in the assumptions we stated because they may be not immediately clear. So suppose we are performing binary classification and uh, suppose the triangles in blue are class one, the dots in red are class two, then we are assuming that these samples are separable, these classes are separable, and there is a, a separating upper plane that has a large margin greater than gamma. Then the other assumption we perform is that there is low rank separability. What does this mean in practice? It basically means that if we take the vector that represents the separating hyperplane and we project it along the various dimensions of the PCA, uh, it has a large projection on the first components of the PCA. So suppose that we are looking at the green vector, the violet vector, and the red vector. These are the three to top three PCA components. Um, as you can see in this example, the separating hyperplane has a strong component in the direction of the green vector. This is what we mean by these two assumptions. However, these assumptions are very unlikely to hold in the pixel space and uh, in general for very high dimensional data. Then what we do is we simply leverage embedding spaces of neural networks. And in particular, we empirically verify that these assumptions hold in the embedding space, or in this case of ResNet 50s trained in a supervised way, SL, or in a self-supervised way, in this case, we show bio. And as you can see, for instance, the rank of the linear classifier is actually much lower um, with respect to the case in which the uh, features are taken directly in the pixel space. And this means that what we do is we take our private label data, we take our public unlabeled data, we pass them through a pre-trained feature extractor. In our case, it's trained on ImageNet, but it can be trained on whatever public distribution. We project both of them. We extract the features, basically. And then we apply the pillar algorithm on top to obtain the epsilon delta DP classifier. And in particular, there are several advantages of these approaches. One is, for instance, there are some papers that claim that you need very large batch sizes in order to get differential privacy, not to cause an extreme drop in performance, uh, especially for DPSGD. And then there's lots of tricks that people come up with. Uh, we show that our method can be run with very small batch sizes. Uh, furthermore, it requires the computation of the PCA only once. Uh, this is different from other methods that instead apply a dimensionality reduction at every iteration. Um, and an interesting thing is that it is such a simple and efficient method that you can just run it on CPU. Uh, this basically happened just because we were running out of GPUs because there was a submission deadline. We tried it on CPU, it ran super fast, we were happy with it, and we've been wasting a lot of GPU. So. Uh, another nice aspect of this methodology is that the hyperparameter selection is sort of facilitated because, uh, as you can see from this plot at the bottom right, as the dimensionality decreases, generally the accuracy increases up to a certain point. So uh, it is pretty easy to do hyperparameter selection. And what we do in this paper is to evaluate the performance in realistic settings. In particular, we point out now three different assumptions that are typically made in the evaluations of these algorithms. One unrealistic assumption is that the pre-training data and the private data are similar. For instance, what people typically do is they have a pre-trained ImageNet feature extractor, and then they do private fine tuning on Cypher 10, Cypher 100. These distributions are very close. However, what we want to do is to test the effectiveness of our methodology also when there is a strong form of distribution shift, which is a more realistic case for private data because we don't expect private data to be as distributed as data that we can just find on the web publicly. Another assumption we do is that uh, we won't, don't want to um, run our algorithm for high epsilon values. Why? Because for the differential privacy definition, if the, the, the notion of distinguishability depends exponentially on the value of epsilon, if epsilon is much larger than one, then we are just giving vacuous bounds. Uh, we focus on settings in which epsilon is actually very tight and smaller than one. And also we focus in cases in which there is not much private data to. In particular, for instance, a typical example, Cypher 10, it has 50K samples. 
In the other, on the other hand, some medical data or whatever form of private data, it's more likely to have very little uh, samples. And in particular, this pneumonia data set we use, it has only 5,000 samples. So we want to focus on these three realistic assumptions. While we obviously validate the effectiveness of our method also in less realistic settings, and in particular, what we observe across seven different data sets, uh, sorry, uh, yes, seven different data sets, is that our methods yields consistent improvements over other baselines. And this occurs not only for data sets like Sefer 10 or Sefer 100, but it also occurs as the distribution shift between the pre-training data and the, um, and the private data increases. Now, it is interesting also to consider presence of distribution shifts between the public data uh, and the private data. In particular, this is possible it is possible to test this, for instance, with Cypher 10, because there are some people that have sampled Cypher 10 several times from the web, and they have observed that uh, the, class, the accuracy of classifiers on Cypher 10 B1, which is this variant of Cypher 10, drops significantly. And what we do is we just use Cypher 10 B1 instead of Cypher 10 as in distribution data in order to compute the PCA. And uh, what we observe is that the performance drop is pretty negligible. Um, this occurs not only when the private data is Cypher 10, but also when the private data is Cypher 100. What we also ablate is um, the case in which there is little public data. And in particular, by default, we reported in the paper uh, generally temp when assuming that there would be access to 10% of the original training set as public data. But of course, we can reduce the access to this public data and, for instance, assume it is 1%. And what we can observe is that the performance drops are also pretty marginal. So. To conclude, we have introduced Spiller. It is an extremely simple algorithm. Uh, it, we can provide some guarantees based on two very simple and reasonable assumptions. Um, and it is a semi-private learning algorithm that tries to exploit more efficiently uh, the availability of public and labeled data. Our results are performed on realistic settings. We consider settings in which there is distribution shift. We focus on tight privacy regimes. And we focus on cases in which there is low uh, availability of data. Do you have any questions?